proposed revisions that always seem to involve less respect for the rights of free nations and less freedom for the individual. These matters would be difficult under any circumstances. They are further complicated by a trend in Western countries away from global engagement and democratic confidence. Parts of Europe have developed an identity crisis. We have seen insolvency, economic stagnation, youth unemployment, anger about immigration, resurgent ethno-nationalism and deep questions about the meaning and durability of the European Union. America is not immune from these trends. In recent decades, public confidence in our institutions has declined. Our governing class has often been paralyzed. The American dream of upward mobility seems out of reach for some who feel left behind in a changing economy. Bigotry seems emboldened. Politics seems more vulnerable to conspiracy theories and outright fabrication. You both were members of Spell and Bones, a secret society at Yale. What does that tell us? Uh, not much, because it's a secret. <laughs> Is there a secret handshake? Is there a secret code? I wish there were something secret I could manifest. 322, a secret number? Uh, there are all kinds of secrets. Now, as you may know, my running mate, Tim, is Catholic and went to Jesuit schools. And one of the things he and I have talked about is this idea from the Jesuits of the Magis, the more, the better. Greetings and welcome to another reading of Code Word Barbalon, Danger in the Vatican with Yerk Glissman and Brett Norman on this July 4th, which is a Wednesday, 2018. And welcome, Yerk. Yes, Brett, thank you very much. And isn't that just a wonderful day to pick the quote-unquote Independence Day, <laughs> where, where yeah. all the American inhabitants today that were colonialists at the time sold their freedom without their knowledge to the Roman Catholic Church. Yeah, that's basically and, what's happened. And, of course, to the Jesuit order of which we are reading in this wonderful book, Code Word Babylon 666, Danger in the Vatican, the Sons of Loyola and Their Plans for World Domination. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I mean, let's not go into um, independence and all that BS. I mean... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, independence we from dealt, God. Yeah, that's really no, what no, it means. <laughs> no, I meant I, I just meant the independence of the United States of America, independence from uh, from England. You know this uh, this war that is celebrated today on the fourth of July because yeah. of 1776. We dealt with that in the book. Yeah, and that's anybody right. who does not understand that, go please back into the playlist and uh, 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 follow our readings of. Um, Rome and the American Civil War, a Jesuit coup d'etat, for example, is uh, a, a chapter that I can uh, advise you to read, or um, uh, even otherwise, um, what is the other one um, about how America became became a Jesuit enclave? Oh, yeah, that that's a that's really a good point, Yerk, is that um, people that are listening to the, to our discussion on a regular basis, if they haven't got a copy of the book yet, should really consider it, you know? Yeah, of course, whether you go back in the playlist and uh, listen to these other broadcasts that we did on earlier chapters where we dealt with the subject I'm just talking about, or of course, you get the book for yourself and you read along with yourself. That that would pr probably even be better, you know? Yeah, uh, yeah, because then you can really slowly take it. Step the other step. one is yeah. The other one is about chapter thirty-one, the Revolutionary War, how America became a Jesuit enclave, and mm -hmm. you have to see, uh, you have to see see that together with the other one that I just mentioned mm -hmm. about um, uh, what's yeah. it called? Uh, here? Chapter twenty-eight, Rome and the American Civil War, a Jesuit exactly. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. then chapter Those twenty-nine, Abraham Lincoln, the Jesuits in the American Civil War. Yeah, yeah, just get the book, you know. Yeah, that's and, right. And do that's the study right. and do the good study point, for yourself. Yerk. So very, very good when you point. don't, yeah, when you do not agree, if you do not agree with anything that we are saying right here in the introduction to this video, which is the I don't know how many number of the Cold Red Babylon reading, well, then just go back to the archives, to the playlist that Brett Norman has on his channel, or the playlist that I do have on my channel, Juggler Sixty Six. Or to anybody else who probably, hopefully, mirrors these videos to get the truth out, 
and uh, or otherwise go to luxverby.com and uh, order a, a, a copy of the book for yourself or do that with Amazon or eBay. I don't care. And do the studies for yourself that you will see that today on the 4th of July 2018 that we have today where we come to the next part of the reading, the American people are actually celebrating their own death. Yeah. And I mean, their own burial, you know, the burial of their freedom they had when they were colonists. And these colonists were lured into the understanding that they needed an independence from something that were actually protecting them, because England was actually protecting the United States from the Roman Catholic Church. But, of course, the young nation that it wasn't at that time, the colonies, had been infiltrated by Jesuits. And by the Illuminati, who were nothing else but Jesuits in the time that they were forbidden. And they yeah, there's a lot going leave. on there too, Yerk, because isn't that the Tractarian movement in in the United Kingdom as well going on? Uh, I don't know what year that started. That was later, though, wasn't it? That was yeah, later. that was that was later. That, that was in the nineteenth. That's right. That was in the nineteenth century. Yeah. yeah, that's right. So this that came out. First. Yeah, the, that's right. The Tractarian movement, I think, was one of the results that came out of the Oxford movement. Yes, that's right. Isn't it? And that mm-hmm. was uh, after mm-hmm. 1830. Right. But, you know, it's, it's just the point that everybody goes outside today having a barbecue mm-hmm. and, and, and fireworks yeah, and celebrating. And we Americans are so great. And they just don't understand real history, how it's the so Americans bombastic. Have, been bet- you're, you're, have been betrayed. It's so bombastic. You got little kids throwing around firecrackers and, you know, shooting off rockets and USA, 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 you know, yeah. you know, bombastic. Right. And and um, it's it's really quite silly. Yeah. So we are just telling you that you have been betrayed and have been lured into a matrix that you are going still uh, that you are going still to pursue. But uh, if you don't, if you take the right pill, and that pill is not neither red nor blue, that pill is Jesus Christ. Then you have the possibility to wake up to that betrayal. Anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. let's yeah. continue in the book, uh, Brett, because I'm really looking forward to have another reading of Cold World Babylon today. As I said on page 495, on the bottom of the page, we are still in the Kingdom of God or Masterpiece of Satan, chapter 40, I don't know, 47 or whatever it is. Yeah, Yeah, 47. Uh, The Secret Doctrine and the sub-chapter that we are dealing with today is The Secret Lives of the Popes. Okay? And I'm going to start reading here, and uh, Brett, as always, will provide the necessary footnotes if there's anything important in them or check if the Bible quotes, when I have to read Bible quotes, that they are uh, according to the 1611 King James Bible, which is the basis of, as Brett's, as my authority of our conscience, the true preserved word of God in the English language today in 2018. Okay? Okay. Thank you, Jürgen. So, So, let's start. The Pope's claim to be comforters of the Church of Christ, his visible replacement on earth. But anyone who is aware of even a modicum of church history, modicum of church history, will know that the popes have proved miserable comforters indeed. The corruptions in Rome, <clears throat> sorry, the corruptions in Rome went all the way to the top. Scores of popes, like the sorcerer Simon Magus, have been proven guilty of simonetical, sim, simoniacal corruptions. Well, this sentence needs a little bit more explanation that people understand that well. Simon Magus. Who is Simon Magus? Simon Magus is that person that we meet in the book of Acts, and if I'm not mistaken, chapter 8, 9, 10? Somewhere there? Mm-hmm. I don't that's know. right. I chapter 8. You got it. Mm-hmm. Chapter 8, right? Yep, that's right. There we meet, there we meet Simon Magus. Simon the Sorcerer. He is the basis for the Roman Catholic Church. And if you want to gain any more understanding on that, I have two advices for you. Uh, Actually, three. (laughs) First one. First one. Sign up for First Amendment Radio's... um, uh, How do you say that? Um, Membership? Archive. Archive. That you Mm -hmm. have access to the archive. 
and go to 2009 and listen to Tom Fress reading the book from Ernest L. Martin, Simon the Simon Peter meets the competition, uh, Simon yeah, uh, right. Peter Simon against Simon Magus, uh, a book that, and that is the second advice that I also will read on my channel, so I don't know by the time of this, when this video that we are just doing here is released, if I have already done that and released my reading of that. Mm -hmm. Those are the first two advices, and otherwise, just Google that, Ernest L. Martin, Simon Magus versus Simon Peter, And you can download that book as a PDF for free. And it's not that big. It has, I think, less than 50 pages. But it's a wonderful explanation about the real, true foundation of the Roman Catholic Church. Scores of popes, as the author says here, like the sorcerer Simon Magus. So he calls Simon Magus a pope. Have you ever heard of that before? I guess not. But this Simon, who was also called Peter, of course, is the Peter that the Roman Catholic Church bases its authority on. Fall apart. When you, of course, understand the book Rulers of Evil, you know that there is also another Peter, the Peter, the firstborn, as we understood, which is Cain, which is why the Roman Catholic Church bears the mark of Cain, as Antichrist Pope John XXIII stated so correctly in his quote-unquote prayer that he spoke in, when was it, 1962 or something, about the time of the Second Vatican Council, where he said that we have the mark of Cain on our foreheads, yeah? mm -hmm. which is the Antichrist himself who states this. But P.D. Stewart has a wonderful understanding when he says that, quote-unquote, scores of popes like the sorcerer Simon Magus have been proven guilty of simoniacal Corruptions. I have to speak very slowly with that word. Simoniacal corruptions. This is why it is called simony when you buy a, um, a clerical office, like a bishop or a cardinal or even a pope, which is a long tradition within the Roman Catholic Church to buy these and sell these. That is why it is called simoniac simoniacal because it is based on Simon Magus, who you meet in Acts chapter 8. Just read Acts chapter 8 and you will understand what it's all about. I'm not going farther into that, but I can really advise you that you subscribe to First Amendment Radio, the archives, and download um, Tom Fress's reading of that book in 2009, or you check my channel if I have uploaded that reading in the meantime, because I'm planning to do that on Simon, uh, Simon uh, Magus versus Simon, uh, Simon Peter. Um, to get an understanding of that, there's only one point that I want to make here where I want to correct P.D. Stewart in this, and that is that these first quote-unquote popes were not popes. They only became popes in the year 606, after the Roman, after the Roman emperor uh, Phocas gave the authority to the Bishop of Rome for the Eastern and the Western Church combined, and by that making him the great bridge builder, the bridge between the East and the West, you know, that you can also understand as in the second chapter of Daniel, the metal man figure, the last empire, that is the Roman Empire, split in two with the two legs, and to build a bridge between these two legs. I don't say that that's the only understanding, but that is one of the understandings that you can get out of Daniel, chapter 2, that this kingdom that is divided in itself cannot stand, as Jesus Christ said. You have these two legs, and then you have the quote-unquote Pontifex Maximus, the highest bridge builder, to build a bridge between these two. Can they therefore stand? Are they therefore not divided? Well, up to today, 2018, they are still divided, and they will be until the end. That is what the Bible tells us. But, of course, the Pope will tell you otherwise. And, therefore, he will build bridges, as many as he wants, to give the illusion to you all, or, as you Americans like to say, to y'all. <laughs> <laughs> That's, That's from down cool. south, by the way. Yeah, I know, yeah. I know. And you know that the southern influence is a Jesuit influence, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know about that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah.
I, I just thought it was a kind of a uh, redneck kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> this southern accent. I, I like to hear that southern accent sometimes. Yeah, you know? it's funny, isn't it? Yeah, it's funny. Yeah. Anyway, well, what was I going to say? <laughs> <laughs> That's so I uh, think we were talking about. Uh... Oh. I... Yeah. About what? <laughs> I've I've completely <laughs> lost lost my train of thought here. Uh, in fairly recent times, the popes, it is alleged, have overseen corrupt banking practices, hmm, the laundering of drug money, trading yeah, okay, you're reading on securities. Yeah. yeah. Okay, you're reading on. Yeah, I, 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 I was still with my comment busy, but I, I don't know. Ah, anymore. with Simon was, Magus still? Yeah. What, yeah, what, what I was talking about. Simon, yeah, anyway. Simoniacal get, co corruptions, yeah. Something. Yeah, of course. This buying of this clerical offices, like yeah, uh, oh, simony, the office yeah, of a that's bishop, mm. simony buying the office of a bishop, of a cardinal, or a cardinal, or a pope, that has a long tradition in the Roman Catholic Church, and of course, the Roman Catholic Church always puts her tradition above the Bible. Okay, so yeah. get yourself, make yourself familiar with those facts, and uh, let us now go on in the reading here. Ah, yeah, the point that I was making that scores of popes, that there were not popes at that time, but mm. only Boniface III in 606 became the first quote-unquote pope. All quote-unquote popes before that were just the bishops of Rome, who didn't even have authority over all the other bishops, as, for example, the bishop of Alexandria, the bishop of Constantinople, the bishop of other churches at that time, because these churches or these other bishops did not even accept the ultramontane authorization of the Bishop of Rome until Emperor Phocas gave Boniface III the possibility to call himself the first quote-unquote Pontifex Maximus. And therefore you have to go a little bit back to the Pope before Boniface III. That was, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Gregory, some I don't know the number, Gregory VII, if I'm not mistaken, who even warned of that, that the first... Um, Bishop, who will call himself the Bishop of Bishops, is the precursor of the Antichrist. Okay? And therefore, you have this in 606, 1260 years, starting until 1866. But that's on another page. Just to make this, this point, scores of popes, as P.D. Uh, Stewart, mm -hmm. Stewart says, yeah, like the sorcerer Simon Magus, have been proven guilty of simoniacal corruptions. And therefore, we have to understand that every pope before 606 was not a pope, but just a bishop of Rome, who was then made by Emperor Phocas the bishop of bishops, because Emperor Phocas gave the authorization, gave the power, yeah, gave the power to the bishop of Rome to be a spiritual and temporal leader over all other bishops. And that's why he is called the quote unquote. Pontifex Maximus today, the, the highest bridge builder. Building bridges is what Pope Francis and all the other antichrists of the last, let's say, 50 years are all about. Building bridges to make everyone come back under the wings of Rome oh, in the name yeah. of ecumenism. John okay? the 23rd, yeah, right. Yeah, John the 23rd, Paul the 6th, John Paul the 2nd, uh, Benedict the 16th, and the one that we have today, Jorge Mario Borgoglio, who calls himself Pope Francis. That's right. All these popes during and after the Second Vatican Council, Brad. Mm -hmm. All those. Yep, that's right. Okay, in fairly recent times, the popes, it is alleged, have overseen corrupt banking practices, the laundering of drug money, trading and counterfeit securities and dealings with the mafia, said to be documented in police and court records. Yeah. That's no question. That are absolutely facts. And therefore, you can go into books like, of course, the Vatican Billions from Avro Manhattan. You can go into the books um, All Roads Lead to Rome from Michael Desemlian. We spoke about that. And you just have to study the, 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 the papal knighthood of the Knights of Malta. And to understand that everywhere where the Knights of Malta have their fingers in and that they control and they are on the top controlled by the Jesuits, that they have the complete control of all the banking systems in the world. Nevertheless, if there are any Jews in the front, like the Rothschilds, the Warburgs, the Schiffs, um, I don't care for all these names, mm -hmm. they are just puppets on the string for the Vatican. Because as you can read in the Encyclopedia Judaica, the Rothschilds are mere 
guardians of the Vatican treasure. Okay, so of course they have uh, overseen corrupt banking practices, the laundering of drug money. Why do you think that George Bush was called Poppy? Yeah, <laughs> because he made sure that in Afghanistan the poppy crop was. Uh, oh, yeah, brought back to a right. higher level, and the whole trading of drugs in the beginning of out of Vietnam, out of Asia during the Vietnam War, and therefore you have this. Um, what's it called? There's even a movie made about in the time uh, with uh, Mel Gibson, Air America. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this Air America who was trading, of course not officially, <laughs> therefore you have to study a little bit, mm-hmm. uh, who were just getting drugs out of. Uh, Vietnam and this uh, delta you have there, um, this drug delta you have there, uh, to the United States of America. And in the 90s, of course, Af- Afghanistan. Yeah? And you, the wonderful soldiers of the United States of America who are there to protect the United States of America from enemies from the outside are today stationed all over the world, among other places, Afghanistan, to make sure that the crops of the puppies will leave and go to the United States of America. And all these soldiers are betrayed because they are not told what they are there for. They think they are defending the freedom of the United States of America, where they are actually just making sure that the corrupt laundering of drug money from the Roman Catholic Church can go on. And these people have no idea, but they are abused. They are misused, they are abused, they are mentally raped. Let me tell you that. That's what the American soldiers are. And not only the American, all quote-unquote soldiers are mentally raped. And to get out of that deception, out of that rape and the consequences of it, there's only one redemption, bread, which is that. Oh, finding our Lord Jesus Christ. Exactly, yeah. Yes. There's only one redemption out Repent. of it. And there's only one way. There's only one door. And there's only one man who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but by me. Jesus Christ. He is the only way out of all of our troubles here in this world. Oh, you can leave all the troubles of this world behind if you just accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. Yep, there's no comparison to that, brother. No doubt. No, no. Nino Lobello, the author continues, Rome's bureau chief for the New York Journal of Commerce, writes in The Vatican Empire that the Vatican is so closely allied with the mafia in Italy that, quote, many people believe that Sicily is nothing more than a Vatican building, unquote. Historically, it was no different. In the book History of European Morals by W. E. H. Lecky, He paints a most lurid picture. Quote, The writers of the Middle Ages are full of accounts of nunneries that were like brothels, of the vast multitude of infanticides within their walls and of that uh, inveterate prevalence of incest among the clergy, which rendered it necessary again and again for the monarchs to issue the most stringent enactments that priests should not be permitted to live with their mothers or sisters. I don't know what that has to do with the mafia right now, but anyway. Hmm. Again, the author of History European Morals records, quote, We may not lay much stress on such isolated instances of depravity as that of Antichrist Pope John XXII, who was condemned, among many other crimes, for incest and adultery, or the abbot-elect of St. Augustine at Canterbury, who in 1171 was found on investigation to have 17 illegitimate children in a single village or an abbot of San Pileo in Spain, who in 1130 was proved to have kept no less than 70 concubines, or Henry III, Bishop of Liege, this is here in Flanders where I live, who was deposed in 1274 for having 65 illegitimate children. 
it is impossible to resist the evidence of a long chain of councils and ecclesiastical writers depicting far greater evils than, things, than simple concubinage. Yeah, I agree with everything that he says, but I don't see how he gets from the one sentence speaking of the mafia <laughs> to this mm. depravity of the... Uh, of the Roman Catholic Church and the popes, of course, and with their uh, breaking of that quote-unquote celibacy, you know, mm -hmm. right? Yep. In another right. place, in another place, the same author adds, "Quote in Rome in 1849, I myself, so speaking of W. E. H. Lecky, visited every convent. I was present at all the investigations, without a single exception." Understand this very well. Without a single exception, that means all, we found instruments of torture and the cellar with the bodies of infant children. Illegitimate babies. The historical records tells us that Pope Honorius, who reigned from 625 through 638 AD, meaning that he was one of the very first popes, as I mentioned a little bit earlier when starting the popes in 606, that Pope Honorius was condemned as a heretic by the Sixth Ecumenical Council of the Catholic Church that was held between 680 through 681. He was also condemned as a heretic by Antichrist Pope Leo II, as well as by every pope after him until the 11th century. Interesting, right? Antichrist Pope Leo II affirmed the verdict. He said, quote, We anathematize Honorius, who did not attempt to sanctify this apostolic church with the teaching of apostolic tradition, but mm. by profane treachery permitted its purity to be polluted. Unquote. Mm. Do you not see how the Pope's halo has become dimmed? <laughs> If he ever had one. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. <laughs> Indeed, we shall see that it has long lost its glow. It never had a glow. Anyway, then there was Antichrist Pope Leo V, who reigned for one month in July 903. The reason for his short tenure is this. In order to usurp Antichrist Pope Leo V, Cardinal Christopher put Leo in prison and took over the papacy. Another, quote-unquote, vicar of Christ, Pope John XXII, who reigned from 955 through 963, was so lustful that the people of his day said that he had turned the Lateran Palace, the mother church of the Vatican, by the way, into a brothel. He was eventually murdered by a jealous husband while in the very act of carnal knowledge, but naked. Yeah, and this is also something that you can read on, yeah. uh, read about in Dave Hunt's book, A Woman Rides the Beast, and Ralph Woodrow's book, A Babylon Mystery Religion. And who can forget Antichrist Pope Benedict IX? He reigned from 1032 to 1044. And again, in 1045, and also from 1047 to 1048. <laughs> three, three times a pontificate of the same person. What does that do to the story of the quote-unquote apostolic succession of the popes? Huh? The citizens of Rome hated Benedict so much that on two occasions he had to flee the city and take to hiding. Like John, the uh, like John the Twelfth, Benedict used the Lateran Palace for his daring liaisons with Italian prostitutes. Yet, the Pope claims to be another God on earth. If the Pope be God upon earth, surely we care not for heaven. On the election of any new Pope, there is an age-old Latin announcement to the people. Habemus Papum, we have a Pope, or we have a Papa, right? But how often with hindsight we might also have added 
malus peor pessimus, bad, wicked, evil, or, as was said of Elemis, the sorcerer, quote, O oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? To quote St. Paul in Acts chapter 13, verse 10. If you find that objectionable, we might use many other scriptural attributives, such as the man of sin, the son of petition, the wicked one, the mystery of iniquity, flagitious, simoniacal, and so on and so forth. For anyone with a schoolboy's knowledge of history knows that the popes have never been on the level. The, record, the records show that the popes do the very thing against which they write. They preach water and they drink champagne. Need we mention the extreme cubity, cubidity of the popes, quote, the profligacy of their lives and the simoniacal arts by which they grasped the popedom? Unquote. No. No. There is no need for the notorious deeds of the various popes have filled many good history books and are open for all to read. But we must press on. There is still a lot to be revealed. Now, still, I don't understand how P.D. Stewart comes from the one sentence to the next, all of a sudden, from the mafia to the depravity of the popes that we are just speaking about, the sexual depravity. I, I don't get it. I don't care. Um, this little subject that we just spoke about, that uh, 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 that we just spoke about, that the popes had many, many, many illegitimate children. They had legions of concubines and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. There are many books written about in history where you can get much more information about than P. D. Stewart just mentioning this on the side. And he is rightfully doing so because if you really want to get into that, you have to read, uh, you have to write a whole library on that, mm. and that is not P.D. Stewart's idea. P.D. Stewart's idea is to give you, with many parts in this book, not with all, because with with a lot of other parts, he goes very deep into the subject, like nobody else has done before, in my opinion, mm -hmm. on the books that I have read here. But with many other things, he just gives you an idea of the topic, gives you here and there a historical link that then you can pursue for your own research. Never, ever forget to do your own research. Never, ever forget to read books other than this, Cold World Babylon. Maybe books that he, P.D. Stewart, puts out here as reference that he used for his research and read those things and then make up your own mind and see that the popes really are not what they say they are, but they are what the Bible says they are. And what does the Bible say the Roman Catholic Church's superior head is? The Pope, the quote-unquote vicarius filii dii? The Bible says he is the man of sin, the son of perdition, the wicked one, the mystery of iniquity, flagitus, simoniaco, and so on and so forth. But as P.D. Stewart says here, we must press on. There's a lot still to be revealed. Now you say there's a lot still to be revealed, but we are on the last 30 pages of this book. Where is then all that much to be revealed coming? Well, <laughs> That's why 666 Danger in the Vatican is Volume 1 or Book 1. We still have Volume 2, The Antichrist is a Woman, to attend to when done with these last about 30 pages we are going to start reading right now. In the next subchapter of still the chapter Kingdom of God, a Masterpiece of Satan, the subchapter is called The Secret Doctrine Revealed at Last. What is the secret doctrine? The Roman Catholic Church is one of the very few, if not the only religion in quote-unquote Christendom, which cultivates a system of symbolism. 
Why? So as to conceal its mysteries. A.C.T. Pearson writes that the origin of the secret doctrine or mysteries throughout the world, quote, though acknowledged under different appellations, unquote, were derived from one source, end quote, can be traced to the plains of Shinar before the disper dispersion of mankind, unquote. This, quote, secret doctrine was also found among the Asiatics, unquote. Now, what does he refer to with the place of Shinar, as we can see, as we can just, uh, as we have just read here? Well, when you go back to the book of Genesis after the flood, uh, Nimrod lived in the place called Shinar, right? Mm. If I'm not mistaken. So where can this mystery all uh, traced all through the world can be traced back to? Nimrod. Babylon, the time right after the flood, when just our wonderful creator killed every life on this earth, except for the family of Noah, Noah and his wife and his three sons and their respective wives, and of all the animals, two of every kind, to make sure, to make very, very sure that the Wickedness was erased, but then again, one of the sons of Noah was infected with the spirit of Antichrist, with the spirit of the devil, and went into the land of Shinar and built Babylon as we know it. And that is the basis to all these mysteries. They try to conceal it, but when you do a real history study, you will not be left in the uh, in the unknown about these mysteries. You can study them for yourself. You can study them while reading this book, or, for example, um, the book "The Two Babylons" from Alexander Hislop, <clears throat> or "Babylon Mystery Religion" from Ralph Woodrow. Two books I absolutely advise everybody to have. And by the way, make sure that from Ralph Woodrow you get the original book from 1966. Uh, not this new one that he put out in the end of the 1990s when he recanted of his earlier work uh, because he, uh, well, watch my video on that. It's in the place Babylon, Babylon Mystery Religion. I don't go into that right now. Mm -hmm. Let us deal with what P.D. Stewart has to say here. So as to conceal its mysteries, yeah, how can they conceal its mysteries? The secret doctrine was also found among the Asiatics. So as Asia, that is, of course, where Babylon sat. The whole structure of paganism, the author continues, was built around a secret doctrine. Quote, each of the pagan gods had, besides the public or open ceremonies, a secret worship paid unto him, to which none were admitted but those who had been selected by preparatory ceremonies called initiations, unquote. So that means that all these pagan, quote-unquote, gods, because there are no gods, they are just idols, have always had a public and a secret worship. And that is exactly the same thing that you have today in the Roman Catholic Church. People who are going into the Roman Catholic Church, and I speak of the John Doe on the streets, you know, the normal man on the street who goes to attend Mass or just wants to go into the Roman Catholic Church and wants to have fellowship with like-minded, quote-unquote, what he thinks Christians, yeah, are being betrayed because they are only told the official uh, worship of the Roman Catholic Church. They are never ever told the secret doctrine, the secret worship. They are all betrayed. And therefore, if they don't understand that betrayal, let them at least come out of that church, that they can learn about that betrayal that is in there, that 
there is an esoteric and an exoteric teaching. And the Roman Catholic Church always tells to the lay people only the exoteric teaching, the official outside teaching of the Roman Catholic Church, and never the kept on the inside secret teaching and secret worship. When you go into the Roman Catholic Church and you are a participant of the Mass and you are a participant of the Eucharist, you are told that you worship Jesus Christ, but you are actually worshiping Baal, Nimrod, Tammuz, idols of pagans who have been Christianized with names. But you know, when you have a pile of shit and you paint it green, it still stays a pile of shit, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. The secret worship, said Mackie, was termed the mysteries. Hence the significance of the use in Revelation of the term Mystery Babylon. The respected John Cardinal Henry Newman. <sighs> respected by whom? Uh, not by me. That's right. And therefore you have to understand that this cardinal was in the beginning a Protestant. And he turned into Roman Catholic Catholicism and was so fervent in his teaching of Roman Catholicism that they even made him a cardinal. But he was, in the beginning, a Protestant. Yeah? That's the history of Henry Newman. If you want to learn about that, go to my reading of All Roads Lead to Rome by Michael de Semlian. The, I say then, quote-unquote, respected, John Cardinal Henry Newman revealed the true source of the Catholic Church's doctrine, which... Tellingly, he also calls the secret doctrines. He writes, quote, How was any secrecy practicable, seeing that the scriptures were open to everyone to choose to consult, who chose to consult them? The secret doctrines of the early church, which he claims was Catholicism, have never been learned merely from scripture. Surely the sacred volume was never intended and is not adapted to teach us our creed, unquote. So what is their creed? What is their secret doctrine, if it is not entirely based on the Bible? Chrysostom, Bishop of Constantinople, of whom we read in an earlier, uh, whom we read in an earlier chapter, of course, a quote-unquote church father, uh, call no one your father but he who, but he who is in heaven, Uh, never forget that. Even though he was a, kid, a bishop of Constantinople, he was a bishop of the Catholic Church. Uh, still, east or west, doesn't matter. Catholic is still Catholic, and Catholic means Antichrist in this regard. Uh? Chrysos, the bishop of Constantinople, returns a full and solid answer when he says, quote, I wish to speak openly but I dare not on account of those who are not initiated. <clears throat> Where the holy mysteries are celebrated, we drive away all uninitiated persons and then close the doors, unquote. And quote-unquote Saint Cyril, Bishop of Alexandria, confirms that there is such a secret doctrine. With this quote, These mysteries are so profound and so exalted that they can be comprehended by those only who are enlightened, meaning the Illuminati. Unquote. So the real meaning behind the icons, symbols, and doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church are only revealed to the initiated. This, dear reader, is veiled Gnosticism. And what is Gnosticism? It's the Greek word for knowledge, speaking of the knowledge of men, and not of the knowledge of the Bible. Yep. The Bible is very clear in that. Yep, that's the Bible right. Says that, the Bible says that wisdom comes through the reading of the world, right? That's and not right. Gnosticism, because that's man-made knowledge, and the heart of man is evil from the beginning, as God said already. Yeah. So you can only gain real Gnosticism if I'm permitted to use that term for once, from the Bible, 
Real knowledge can only be apprehended from the Bible and not from men and men's teaching. This is veiled Gnosticism, the author says. The real meaning behind the icons, all the icons, all the idols and symbols and doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church are only revealed to the initiated. So, when you as John Doe go into that church and you are um, venerating these different icons, idols, symbols and doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church, you are actually giving power to something that is even not revealed to you because you are not initiated. You are giving power to demons and fallen angels by your veneration of things that you think are Christian when they are not. Yeah? This, P.D. Stewart says, is veiled Gnosticism. Why does he choose to say this is veiled Gnosticism? Well, I think because P.D. Stewart is very much aware about the fact that Catholicism is nothing else but veiled Christianity. Did you get that? Catholicism is veiled Christianity. When in 321 AD, Emperor Constantine made, quote-unquote, Christianity the um, state religion of the then pagan Roman Empire and baptize the Roman Empire, the pagan Roman Empire, with quote-unquote Christianity. That is veiling. That is the veil of the, um, of the Gnostic, of the pagan Roman Empire, under the guise of Christianity. And that's why Catholicism calls itself Christianity. But it is not Christianity. It is the hidden pagan Roman Empire from the beginning until the end. Because in Daniel we learn, again, chapter 2, that there are only four empires from the time that Daniel is with, is the, with, with the Jews in Babylonian captivity. We learn that there are four empires until Jesus Christ returns. First the Babylonian, then the Medes and the Persians, then the Grecian, and then the Roman Empire, which is in twofold. You have the pagan Roman Empire at first, and then you have papal Rome, the last, until the stone not cut out with hands smashes this last empire and the whole figure, the whole construction of human empires in the feet and makes them crumble into dust. And this dust is put all around the world by the wind until it has never been seen no more. And then the stone that was not cut out with hand that uh, hit that figure in the feet becomes a great mountain that encompasses the whole world to be a kingdom that is forever and ever. And that's the kingdom of our Lord, Jesus Christ. How much you can make of this one little sentence, huh? Mm. Yeah, that's right. Do you have a comment there, Brett? Well, uh, let's see. Uh, there's there's all kinds of uh, interesting things we can link to Gnosticism. One of them being Freemasonry, right? Yeah, absolutely. The G, the G in Freemasonry. You think of Gnosis. At least I do. Yeah, and that's true. Uh, um, you know, in the the older dictionary here, the eighteen twenty eight. You can look that up. Uh, look up uh, Gnosticism up in the 1828 Webster's. It's really interesting just to look at that alone. And mm -hmm. what uh, does it say? Um, I don't have it in front of me at the moment. Oh, um, okay. But uh, it's uh, I might lose my power here really quick. Um, apparently, uh, the uh, lightning is coming. And uh, just so everyone knows, if this uh, gets interrupted, that uh, this is due to the weather, and it's not due to me. <laughs> um, I had one of my computers uh, actually blow out from a lightning strike some years ago, um, but uh, no big deal. I mean, you know, these things happen, and uh, this is uh, interesting that... Uh, we're getting some lightning and thunder right now 
uh, to teach these children on the lake here that, uh, you know, they're, they're shooting off firecrackers just a little while ago. Uh, kind of give them some, of some of the Lord's firecrackers here. <laughs> <laughs> we'll show you some real boss, uh, bombasticism here. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, no, uh, Gnosticism and, and Freemasonry, um, I mean, they, they well, claim let's, to let's have the go, true knowledge of, of the scriptures, you know. Let's go to, let's go to Webster's Dictionary. It yeah. says, Gnosticism, the doctrines, principles, or, or systems of philosophy taught by the Gnostics. And go. the Gnostics, of course, are the Grecians, the Greek, yeah? mm -hmm. Greek the empire, empire. That, is, that came before the Roman Empire. That's because right. Because Rome is built on the philosophy of Plato, Socrates, and Aristotle, yeah, Aristotle. So, mm -hmm. on the Grecian philosophy, builds the pagan Roman Empire, and it is the pagan Roman Empire that still rules today under the guise of "quote unquote" Christianity. I think that makes a point, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Sure does. Sure does. So, as as long as you have any electricity there, shall we continue reading? Yeah, please. No, let's go. I have okay. No no problem. <laughs> Plenty of time today. So what is this secret doctrine? What is this veiled Gnosticism? It is the same doctrine held and understood by those of the 30th, 31st, 32nd, and 33rd degree of Freemasonry. The very doctrine taught by the Knights Templars, which is Johannism, or Gnosticism, or Kabbalism. And it involves in veneration uh, it involves then that the Jesuits are revived Knights Templars. Recall, quote, the Templars had two doctrines, one concealed and reserved for the masters, the other public. And the public doctrine of the Knights Templars was Roman Catholicism. Now, if you still doubt these revelations, then consider this fact. On May 16, 2002, the Sun Chronicle reported that court documents revealed that a Roman Catholic priest by the name of James Porter confessed to Antichrist Pope, this, uh, Antichrist Pope uh, probably Paul VI, in 1973, mm -hmm. uh, because it doesn't say the That's name right. here, but Pope Paul VI was uh, reigning um, during the Second Vatican Council until 1978 of having sexually abused dozens of little children. But the professed quote-unquote vicar of Christ did nothing to prevent further violation of other innocent victims. The report said that, quote, former North Attleboro priest James Porter told Antichrist Pope Paul VI in 1973 that he had been sexually molesting children for nearly 20 years. T, that is 2-0, 20 years before victims stepped forward to reveal the abuse they had suffered. While he was a priest in the Diocese of Fall River in the 1960s, he pleaded guilty to molesting 28 children in 1993. These things may make uncomfortable reading for sincere Roman Catholics, but it is a fact that both heterosexual and sodomite acts of depravity have been practiced and are sanctioned within the Roman Catholic priesthood for hundreds and even thousands of years, taking into consideration the Babylonian roots of the Roman Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. And why is that? That they have been practiced and sanctioned this depravity of heterosexual and sodomite acts because they are idolaters. You have to understand Exodus chapter 20, Leviticus chapter 18, Leviticus chapter 20, and Romans chapter 1 in combination to understand what the author here is speaking about. As to the Holy Sisters, Catholic Cardinal Peter Daly said that he dared not to describe the sexual immorality carried on in the nunneries, but was prepared to say that, quote, 
taking the veil was simply another mode of becoming a public prostitute. Of course, not all nuns are implicated. No doubt many are decent women. But unfortunately, a great many too are defiled by the common priests and high-ranking clergymen. And then we go into the next subchapter of Kingdom of God or Masterpiece of Satan called The Church Here in Babylon. But that will be for another day. I think for the 4th of July 2018 we have come to a conclusion of this subchapter of the reading of Cold World Babylon. The secret doctrine revealed at last what we were dealing with and the secret lives of the Pope even have been possible have been in uh, have been able to read some six or five five pages as almost as always <laughs> nothing new under the sun there yeah but that's right. um, we've come to the hour and uh, therefore i want to come to the conclusion and say to everybody who listens and uh, or watches these videos and from the bottom of my heart urge them to do their own research and start with that research in the Bible. And whenever here in the world there is something going on that is not measuring up to the standards and the moral standards of the Bible, then it is anti-biblical, then it is anti-Christ, because that is the system that we are living in. Open your eyes and start to learn. It is never too late, never ever too late to turn to Jesus Christ. And you can only do that when you know him. So turn to the 1611 authorized version of the King James Bible and make sure that you understand the correct word of God in the English language preserved today. And by that, you can build a personal relationship with your Lord and Savior. And you will see through all this quote-unquote Gnosticism that is taught in the Roman Catholic Church, that is taught in all schools, that is taught in all universities, that is taught all throughout the television, newspapers, magazines, Hollywood movies, television series, all in this Antichrist system that we are doomed to live in. And there is only one way out, and that is Jesus Christ. I leave the closing remarks for Brother Brett. For me, until next time, Maranatha. Thank you, Yerk. That is a wonderful way to close today, is to encourage our listeners to consider the deeper aspects of their faith and that uh, prayers, when they are asked in humility, always, always, always get answered i've always had wonderful experience with that i can vouch for is a prayer that comes from your deepest parts can be the most rewarding but you must be patient and know that the lord is there and that he cares for the righteous men and women of this world those that abide in his holy doctrine in the 1611 King James Version of the Bible that so many of Christendom have left today. And, uh, and we're living in a fragmented and shattered, broken world that we can put the pieces back together and make it work. And we can find the way to our Lord and Savior in private, and he will deliver us from the evil doings. But we must have faith. And if you don't have faith, just simply ask. ask. Ask it of the Lord in private. And that's all I got to say. And we'll catch up with you next time. God bless and bye-bye. That for the first time in human history, for the first time in all of human history, almost all of mankind is politically awake. And these new and old major powers face still yet another novel reality, in some respects unprecedented. 
And it is that while the lethality, the lethality of their power is greater than ever, their capacity to impose control over the politically awakened masses of the world is at a historical low. I once put it rather pungently, and I was flattered that the British Foreign Secretary repeated this as follows. Namely, in earlier times, it was easier to control a million people, literally, it was easier to control a million people than physically to kill a million people. Today, it is infinitely easier to kill a million people than to control a million people. It is easier to kill than to control. We're, we're, we're at the very beginning stages of a very brutal and bloody conflict. Um, and I believe that um, we've come horribly off track uh, in the years uh, since the fall of the Soviet Union. And we're starting uh, now in the 21st century, which I believe strongly is a crisis both of our church, a crisis of our faith, a crisis of the West, and a crisis of capitalism. His son Jesus is here in our midst. His bride, the church, is honored to host an event affirming the dignity of the human person and the sacredness of all human life. I think Russia is no longer a communist state, first of all. That's very important to realize. It hasn't yet defined itself, however, effectively as a democracy. It is still uncertain. We're, we're at the very beginning stages of a very brutal and bloody conflict, of which if the people in this room and the people in the church do not bind together and really form what I feel is an aspect of the church militant, if the people in this room and the people in the church do not bind together and really form what I feel is an aspect of the church militant, the church militant, to really be able to not just stand with our beliefs, but to fight for our beliefs against this new barbarity that's starting, uh, that we will literally eradicate everything that we've been bequeathed over the last uh, 2,000 to 2,500 years. You didn't mention the president by name, but it was hard not to conclude that that's who you were referring to. Is that fair? I was certainly referring to the threats that we are now facing with this stated goals of this administration, which would upset the last 70 years of a new world order, which was established after World War II. 70 years based on human rights, respect for the law, uh, free trade, all of the things and aspects of this world order that took place after one of the most horrific, uh, terrible wars in history, and I'm for maintaining it. We are grateful to be citizens of one nation under God, who acclaim this evening that in God we trust. Bless our two candidates, our benefactors, and those whom the L. Smith Foundation has been honored to serve for seven decades. Guide us safely home, both this evening and for all eternity, through Christ our Lord. Amen.